So uh, first of all, thank you, Ahmad, Julian, like the whole uh, team uh, for inviting me over here. Uh, it's, it's really is an honor. Um, so my name is Wim uh, I, I work for NXP Semiconductor. And we, we built many things. We do automotive and IoT, mobile phone stuff, et cetera. Um, just not the oscillator part. Uh, but the area where I'm part from or where I come from originally is telecommunication. And, and you know, the 3GPP uh, side of it, so 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, and I'm sure there'll be a 6G uh, somewhere down the line. And what, uh, what I'm trying to talk about today is, you know, the, to maybe add an additional source of time in that magical list of, you know, GPS 1588, or sync E, you know, maybe there's a little bit more. Uh, you know, where else can we source time from? Uh, specifically here for the data center use, but I think in fact the, the use case uh, might go a little bit beyond just data centers, or if you look at it differently, the data center is moving towards the edge of the network, right? Consider industrial use cases, uh, consider, uh, you know, your, your neighborhood gaming server, you know, whatever it may be, I, I need accurate time, and we see that requirement proliferating. Um, if you look at it very NXP-centric, self-driving cars, if they're not synchronized, we probably have an issue uh, when you all cr hit the same crossing. Um, my personal background is it is 3GPP, so I talk about this whole ORAN, small cell, et cetera, area that everybody's brought up. It's, it seems to be the dominating use case in the data center, and it's very accurate. Um, but if I, uh, if I put or if I convert my neighborhood server into a base station, into a distributed unit, it needs a source of time. But in an environment like this, you know, GPS <laughs> doesn't really work. Uh, GPS antenna doesn't, doesn't reach through a metal ceiling. And 1588 may work very well to distribute uh, time and frequency within uh, or 1588 and sync e may very well work to distribute time and frequency within the data center, uh, but not outside to inside. And, you know, uh, rubidium and cesium clocks, et cetera, are not necessarily cheap, and uh, a lot of my customers who request cheap stuff. Um, so the question is, what else can we use as a source of time? And um, one of those, of course, your, your friendly neighborhood operator. You know, this is the one thing that you get for free from AT&T, Verizon, Deutsche Telekom, and China Mobile is time. Um, you don't need a SIM card. You don't need monthly subscriptions. Stick an antenna in the air and extract from that 3GP network uh, the information that you need. And I think actually you can do a little bit more than just time. We'll talk about that later. Of course, the idea is not necessarily that I'm trying to replace uh, a GPS unit, but it's more to add more timing sources because in the end, you'll end up uh, averaging or by other means combining time sources to increase precision. And that's what we're trying to get at here. Um, so it wasn't asked to make the slides a little bit technical, so I added a picture of an LTE frame, give or take accurate. Um, you don't need to get into the detail here, but the, the point is that all these 3GPP networks, and this is the fundamental difference between a 3GPP network and, for example, a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth network, is that these 3GPP networks, so that's 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, and maybe 6G, are all fundamentally TDM networks. They operate in the same way as E1, T1, or SDM1, OC3, for the older people amongst us. You know, it's, it's a TDM network. And that means that there is an organized frame structure. So in LTE, I've got a 10 millisecond radio frame. That radio frame is split into subframe, and the subframes are split into slots, and the slots are split into OVM symbols. You know, it's a wonderful hierarchy that is very well documented in, in a bunch of specs that are publicly available. Um, but the point is, there is a framing structure. And the question is, you know, if I stick an antenna in the air and I decode these frames or receive these frames, what can I extract? Again, for free. That's the key thing. <laughs> um, so first, you know, there's two pieces or three pieces that I need if I want to emulate 
a GPS unit, right? I want to extract time or phase, I want to extract frequency, and I want to extract geolocation. I want to figure out where I am. No, that was the original purpose. So how do I get time? If I look at the 3GPP frame, that, that 10 millisecond radio frame is the start of it, so each 10 millisecond frame, the, the start of that is aligned by spec to um, universal time, to UTC. Right? That's the reason that everybody that's building oscillators here has, uh, has to provide that GNSS input to the base station from the operator. Uh, once that base station transmits it, I can receive that uh, that time, you know, that, that radio frame is inherently time aligned. So that gives me essentially uh, the capability to say, okay, I can generate a 10 millisecond interval pulse, and I know that the, that pulse, the start of it, is time of phase aligned to what eventually comes back to a PPS pulse that comes out of a GPS unit at the neighborhood base station. So that gives me uh, an aligned 10 millisecond pulse. I just don't know which time it aligns to. How do I extract that? Uh, it turns out that, and that's at the bottom of the slide, um, let's see if I can, uh, this works, that's somewhere there. Somewhere deeply buried in these three GPP frames, there's a thing called primary and secondary synchronization signal, PSS and SSS, and combined, you know, that is, couple of dozen bits that are transmitted every 10 milliseconds. And out of those couple of dozen bits, I can extract, I believe it is a 10-bit uh, sequence number. And that sequence number is called the system frame number. And that system frame number um, increments, again, in a predefined pattern compared to UTC time. So now I can align I, cannot, I don't have to generate a 10 millisecond pulse, I can generate, woohoo, a PPS pulse, pulse per second. In fact, I can get a little bit more intelligent and uh, start aligning that. Once I have a pulse per second, I can, for example, compare that or use an NTP server that's really available pretty much everywhere to get coarse time and use this PPS pulse to get fine time. So now, I can extract calendar time, you know, date, uh, time, date, etc. So we're getting somewhere. Second piece is frequency synchronization. How do I generate a, you know, 10 megahertz or whatever this uh, clock? And for that, there's two ways of doing it. Um, you can, of course, use the PPS pulse to discipline an oscillator and generate your frequency that way. The, the second way of doing it, and, and that's the way that, uh, that we happen to have done it, is to say, you know, when I do, if I, if I look at a base station transmission some, from a base station to a mobile phone, that, uh, that transmission happens at a, at a set frequency, right? 3GPP defines a frequency roster, you know, that, I don't know, uh, T-Mobile in the US transmits at 600 and something megahertz for their low band, you know, and that frequency is very well defined. And obviously, in the base station side, that frequency comes from a very expensive oscillator um, that uh, was previously discussed. So the job of the client, you know, effectively my mobile phone or, you know, the, the widget that we're building, inside the client, there is an algorithm to tune a local oscillator that feeds into an RF PLL that generates that RF frequency. So if, as part of a channel estimation, channel equalization algorithm on the client side, and we're effectively building a client here, I need to adjust that RF carrier frequency. And by doing that, I inherently uh, calibrate or control the local oscillator, make it go faster and slower, and therefore generate a frequency reference that is derived, again, from my friendly neighborhood base station. And that is basic uh, uh, correlation algorithm, uh, again, on those primary and secondary synchronization channels. And all of that stuff, you know, the, the technicals of, technicalities of how to do that, there's a gazillion IEEE papers about for everybody that ever built a mobile phone. So what does that get me? Right, these synchronization signals give me um, 
a time, right? It gives me a PPS pulse. And with, the, uh, with an alignment to an NTP network, you know, if NTP time is available, I can align that to calendar time. Or I can actually start decoding not just those primary and secondary synchronization signals, but dig in a little bit deeper in the 3GBP spec and you find the so-called system information blocks in 4G and in 5G that actually give a mechanism to the base station to transmit you know, full calendar time, again, in a broadcast fashion to all the mobile phones. So it can actually get rid of that NTP alignment. So that gives me time and frequency, but I don't know yet uh, how to do geolocation, right? I'm trying to emulate a GPS unit, so I also want to know where I am. Um, why do I need to know where I am? Well, first of all, because I want to be a GPS. Uh, but secondly, because there is a over-the-air latency between the base station and the client, and that over-the-air latency, right, is a microsecond per kilometer type of, uh, type of number, that, is going to, that turns out to be the main limiter of accuracy here for that phase alignment. And in order to compensate for that over-the-air delay, I need to figure out where I am as compared to the base station so I can compensate for, that, uh, for the delay. And that effectively means I need to triangulate where I am physically. And that, so that is geolocation. How do you do geolocation? Um, all this gets very finicky. The idea is that you're not necessarily listening to one base station at a time. You know, if you stick an antenna in the air, you know, this here in the US, I've got three primary operators, right? AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon. I'm, I don't, I'm not relying on a SIM card. I'm not stuck to a single one. So I can listen to three of those base stations from three different operators. And remember, they're all, all of them are aligned to UTC. So if I receive three signals and I have three estimates of a PPS pulse, I can do straight up triangulation or I can do you know, uh, somewhat more fancy algorithms. There's, there's a great YouTube video uh, from Chalmers University in, in Sweden on how to actually do this type of algorithm with only one or two base stations. But the idea is that um, I need to figure out what is, where those base stations are. Turns out the internet is of great help. Um, there's those same system information blocks that are carried in 3GPP frames carry a variety of cell identifiers, a bunch of acronyms that say, which base station am I? There's a cell ID, and an MCC, and an MN, uh, MNC, and you know, a bunch of different abbreviations, but fundamentally uh, an array of data that our friends at Google actually uh, open sourced uh, the, the results of them driving around neighborhoods there are, and from Google and others, uh, public databases where I can basically inject that array of data and figure out where the neighborhood base stations are, thereby enabling me to do triangulation, thereby figuring out where I am, where my base stations are, and compensate for over-the-air latency, which we believe should work. Haven't done that yet, though. Um, so the question becomes, what have we done? So um, uh, NXP semiconductors, right? So we're in the chip business, surprisingly enough. Um, and uh, what we happen to have built for this is a, a tiny little software-defined radio. So this is not trying to be a whole mobile phone client. It's not trying to be a base station or anything fancy. But a software-defined radio that's basically the combination of a microcontroller, uh, something like 80 gigaflop or so DSP, that does all the, uh, the number crunching, and a bunch of ADCs and DACs and general purpose I.O., et cetera. That allows us to build a software-defined radio that can decode, um, for example, a 4G LTE signal, but obviously, ideally, decode whatever is out there, right? 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, 6G, and so on, and so on. So that's the orange bit, because I'm Dutch. That's where it's, you have to pick orange as a color. Um, Anybody wants to know the reason. And we've combined that with basically a front end as you will find it in, in any mobile phone, right? An RFD modulator that gets me from the carrier frequency down to baseband, combined with a, with a set of LNAs, RF filters, et cetera, where 
the more LNAs filters you have, um, the more bands you can look at, the more operators you can look at, and the more accurate or more globally capable system you can build, right? This is the exact same stuff as a mobile phone. You can buy a cheap one that only supports a couple of operators, or you can buy an expensive one that looks at everything out there. So what we've done is, um, we're not as good as, as Julian is at building hardware, but we, we built the ugly version. Um, that's this one here. And um, surprisingly enough, it works. Um, so what we did, so we're showing the, uh, the, the age of the equipment in our lab here a little bit, but the equipment still does the job. So we've built a board, and we've written the software for scanning an LTE 4G base station, or whatever is out there, for a handful of RF bands. We've benchmarked that against you know, uh, an expensive GPS unit, and what we've seen is, you know, if we cheat a little bit and sit close enough to the base station to make the over-the-air latency go away, um, what we see is actually remarkable accuracy in an experimental setup, right? This is not a full formal test, but a remarkable accuracy both in terms of phase alignment and frequency accuracy in, in what we're pulling out. And it's actually that accuracy is achieved by doing that channel estimation method of, of figuring or of disciplining the oscillator. And you know, if you look at what the uh, previous talk was about, you know, the, the magical one and a half microsecond uh, accuracy of providing a time to an indoor small cell, you know, whatever it is, it easily hits that type of a spec. Um, so uh, we're quite uh, we're quite proud of that, I guess. Um, of this, of the lab setup working. And we're trying to figure out, you know, what's next, where do we go here? I think this, uh, uh, obviously, today, sure, we have a couple of people building a 4G solution. There's a lot there out there. There's, uh, we've got partners working on 5G. But you can do 2G, 3G. You can use the same hardware to use decode GPS. You can synchronize to satellites. You know, there's Elon Musk has one, Jeff Bezos has one. Whatever is out there, we should be able to synchronize to it if they are synchronous by themselves. And, and that brings us why Amat uh, and I uh, started talking. You know, what we are trying to do is trying to figure out the right way to make this available um, uh, to the uh, telecom appliance community. Uh, uh, we're, we're working with a bunch of people to get hardware to move from, from our ugly initial hardware to something a little bit more elegant and a little bit more available stuff. And we're trying to figure out how to enable uh, the software community with this to evolve uh, the performance, as well as the specs, you know, which bands you can, you can look at. So um, the, part, the part itself, the magical DSP part, you can, uh, you can find the internet. Um, but maybe it's easier if you, anybody has any questions that you're you know, afraid of to, uh, to ask here, just shoot me an email. Um, I typically answer quite quickly if it doesn't go to spam. Um, but, uh, uh, available for any questions. So that's our widget. Thank you. Please. Uh, very interesting topic. Um, has the impact of multi-passing increased? Uh, in our heads, yes. Um, <laughs> so um, we, what we have not done, just to start with the negative, is done an elaborate set of measurements, you know, drive around tests, et cetera. Right now we're in the status of, like, look, we have a widget, and look at the lines, we're so happy. What we have done is, um, obviously as you do this development, you first start with a bucket of samples that you pour into MATLAB, and we see the multipath effect, and you know, obviously it's an OVDM signal, so there's a reason for a cyclic prefix, and you can fundamentally see where the first signal out of a multipath signal comes in, and that's what we do today. Just lock into the first one and then pray that that is the one that is not bouncing off a, a building. Um, which, you know, is the, the most straightforward strategy. I think that, uh, I think there's two, th two ways of looking at this. Number one, more is better. So you wanna look at every base station around you and the number of you know, frequencies are being used increases and that helps you narrow that down, so that's one. Number two, I said I'll, um, I'll reach out to you later um, with that YouTube video of uh, the academic work that's going on 
in, in how to figure that out. And now you can start talking about MIMO receivers. You know, the, the widget actually has four receive paths in it. So you can do some clever things if you go down that path. Uh, but you know, we might not be clever enough to do all of that by ourselves. That's where he comes in. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, yeah, cool stuff. Uh, quick you. question, does it work for a private 5G at the edge? Or yes. Not a public service? And in that case, where do you get the database from the stations? Is, does your, is it smart enough to pull it from somewhere? Is not a URL loaded and I'll learn it by itself? No, so if it's, if it's a private network, right, then um, it depends on where that private network is required to store its data. Now, if you look at the US, right, CBRS, right. in CBRS bands, and I'm not an expert, so I'm sure, I know I'm being recorded, someone's gonna call me out. But there is a requirement to actually record where the base stations is located. So you get the geo, uh, geolocation back again. Um, but that might, that's the US. Um, similarly, I know the German regulations, again, there's a record, uh, you know, there's a document. Um, the US is the FCC, in Germany is uh, Bundesamt for something. Uh, so I think, broadly speaking, it should be able to be done, but caveat. Great. Thank you. So we are a little bit short in time. I mean, I mean, sure. Go. I, I, I never prevent people asking questions. Come, come, come ahead. <laughs> so we just not not. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw your your hardware board, mm -hmm. and just have the question. In the uh, it looks like a layerscape, right? Not necessarily fan. Uh, yeah, layerscape access we call it, LA. Oh, right. um, okay. So in that. Your, your DS, because you're designed using the SDR, mm -hmm. so you, de you definitely have the DSP somewhere. Yes. Is that the DSP is a part of the, your layer scope building in yes. core, or it's just something additional? So this is a small chip, you know, it's one by one centimeter of what, you know, small, small chip. Okay. It's both a microcontroller and the DSP and ADC DAC and a bunch of, you know, timers and low speed IO and you know, all kinds of stuff around it. Okay, uh, because I also know you guys have the quite good, uh, the radio related, like RF, FFE. Mm -hmm. Those things, why those kind of, uh, instead of using the SDR, mm -hmm. why not just using the, those kind of whatever you have, the, you know, RF, uh, FE, and to do the similar thing? It's and and, so, and uh, this is not an NXP specific thing, right? This is yeah. generic. Any radio, Wi-Fi, mobile phone, base station, or this widget, you have these three components, right? You have the modem itself, which is digital logic, either a DSP or an ASIC. Yep. You have uh, LNAs and filters, just analog little one millimeter parts. And then almost always, if, if, unless you go into high-end base station space, you have a, an RFD modulator. So each one comes in low-end, mid-end, and high-end, and you know, cheap and expensive, but in the end, all these, it's, all these three components are available. And sure, NXP builds LNAs, and I love you to use it, but you can use anybody's at the same time. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it.